All right. Well, we're talking LAFC and who better to talk to than the person who's been there since day one, put this all together, stands up on top of the press box on the roof, uh, walking around on TV quite often as well. Uh, John Thornton himself. John, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Dave. Pleasure to be here. Uh, I I assume they're going to try and sell seating up there for MLS Cup. Are you going to be able to keep everyone off your roof? You know, I kept it under wraps for so long and now the secret is fully out which is unfortunate um but uh for liability reasons there will be no public okay. or anybody other than basically myself and a few analysts uh allowed up top uh all right so let's start with this what's your feeling right now you win the western conference on on sunday what's sort of been the emotions for you over the last few days yeah i one of excitement. I think this is obviously our, our first time in an MLS Cup final. It's not the first time in a final, but uh, first time in an MLS Cup final. I think it's not too dissimilar to the excitement of winning a supporter shield, but realizing there's still work to be done mm-hmm. and trophies up for grabs. And we won the Western Conference. There is no shame in celebrating being on top of what I felt was a very strong conference this year. And beating a very good Austin team, having previously beat a good Galaxy team. And so there's much to be proud of, but at the same time, you reserve ultimate celebration for what we hope is to come Saturday. Uh, I want to look back before we dig into Saturday, because for you guys, it was almost instant success in Major League Soccer. But as I think about it going into MLS Cup and as I started to dig into it, a lot of flux and a lot of movement that got us to this point. So I want to start, I believe it was the Manhattan Beach Marriott where we first spoke about LAFC in 2017 before you guys were even in MLS and then obviously 2018 and beyond. Talk to me about what you thought the identity, the roster build, the style of this club would be and then where we are now and how maybe that shifted or is the same. Yeah, I think we set out before we had a coach, before we had any players, before we had an academy. Before I had any staff, frankly, I had a number of conversations with owners, with supporters, with key decision makers as to what we wanted this club to be on and off the field. I think by that point, there was already some incredible momentum off the field before we had signed anybody. And our job was sort of to match that on the field and give sort of satisfy this appetite that we had seen that frankly being from LA, I was surprised by that we were getting 5,000 people to events before we we were celebrating a play, anything. And so it was a very thorough and diligent process as to what on-field product would best represent our city, our supporters that they would readily identify with and satisfy this appetite, this growing appetite for the game in a downtown location, all, all the all the ingredients that were already in place. And we did that. It sounds very abstract, but we looked at the style of play, the makeup of the team, and did our best to represent that on the field. And I think, of course, things evolve, but there has not been any revolution here at all. We are, this is what we sought out to do, to have a team that plays the way we play, that has the makeup of players that we have, our business model requires more activity at certain levels of the roster and, and what have you. And it has been through that filter that we've made every decision from who our first coach was to our second coach was to our, to what we do with our Academy, to who our players are, who, how we spend our discretionary money, what players we go around at the league. And I think what you're seeing this year is certainly while we are strategically very disciplined as to where the guardrails are, we also apply lessons. And we've had four years of lessons Mm -hmm. and learning along the way that we then would be sort of remiss not to apply. And I think we've done that this year. And that's something that is an ongoing process, frankly, with each transfer window. What are we learning? What did we learn by not signing a DP in January that informed, you know, this is what this team needs moving forward. This is the player we'll go after in the summer all these sorts of things that are a constant evolution, but never departing from the vision of how this team would represent our city. Uh, One of the lessons I wanted to ask you about was the designated player spots, because Carlos Vela has obviously been the cornerstone of this franchise. 
But alongside him, for the most part, until recently, it was younger pieces in those other DP spots. Diego Rossi, Brian Rodriguez, Andre Horta at the beginning as well. Now you have Dennis Buanga, Christian Teo, and you know the mm -hmm. difference in potential contract with him and Gareth Bale, mm -hmm. what it is. Was that a learning process of, of feeling like you needed to lean on, on more veteran players in that spot, or is that just circumstantial? I think there are pros and cons to both. I think the what we saw with our team in 2019 and the team that made a run to the Champions League final, I think it was a younger group. And I would say as you are building a roster, I think a younger group of talented players is a more volatile investment. I mm -hmm. think the way I look at that is it's potentially higher reward and higher ceiling on the field. If you hit it right with a player that you could sell for millions into Europe, it's higher reward, but there's higher risk to that. So for us, each season, each transfer window, we assess finding that right balance. I think it will always be a part of this club that we will invest in youth. Uh, we'll start to see that with our academy. In fact, I just, the reason we haven't is just simply because our academy kids are 17 years old and not yet graduated. Uh, we've signed a few homegrowns, but I think the other thing that changed from year one to now is we are able with our U22 spots to mm -hmm. also identify, recruit young talent that would historically have been DPs. Right. So when you look at Palacios and Cifuentes, those would have been DPs. Now, originally it was Diego, it was Brian, and we moved those both on uh, when the right deal came along and the right timing for us. But that's another thing that shifted, which then maybe opened up this possibility. The plan is always to have a young designated player, which is what we are looking for for next year now that we have the ability to create that opening in January. And so Dennis was this swing DP that we had Carlos and we looked at young players and if the right young player were there, we'd assigned him. But mm -hmm. for us, Dennis, which what you're seeing now, we identified a specific player with a specific profile that we didn't find in the younger players and ownership made the resources available. And, and thanks to how we've managed our budget, within plan and, and what have you, we were able to sign Dennis. So long-winded way of saying you take the information you have to hand. We certainly have a model that we need to stick to. And it's always a portion of our team will be about investing in young players, developing them, helping us win and moving them on. And I think the key difference relative to 2018, when you had, in 19, we had two young DPs is the addition of the U22 initiative. Which feels like you guys were one of the people that, sort of pushed for the need of that of you had Atuesta type players on the roster you pushed for Palacios Cifuentes it felt like and you can correct me if you think I'm wrong but it felt like for you you were able to whether it's because it's LA attract or ID a higher level of South American talent that probably has eyes on moving through MLS to Europe which is now everyone has the th these three spots to use it mm -hmm. felt like LAFC was kind of early in this starting in 2018. Yeah, it's not, you know, scouting and identifying. It's not just a switch you turn on. And I think we've always been built for that. And initially, as I mentioned, it was for our younger DPs yeah. and the Atuestas. And, and Edward was a TAM player when he came in. Mm -hmm. Now it would be slightly different given the mechanisms uh, available to us with, with the U22 initiative. But so for us, we were structured to find that supply of talent. We have incredible scouts on the ground in South America. We have a great scouting department, data and analytics department here in-house that helps us with our player identification and recruitment. And then, you know, we're able, I do think, to show players what the path looks like from where you are to L.A. And whether that means you stay here for a number of years and help us win or move on, we're also open to that. And I think we're starting to see a more well-worn pathway as mm -hmm. we've moved a few of our players on the movement to me is the big thing that stands out so i looked back loss in the first round to rsl in 2018 in the postseason carlos vela latif blessing those are the only two players from that roster still on the team 2019 western conference finals eddie segura also on that roster that's it talk to me a little bit just about the constant flow and movement do you see it the way i describe it as there's been a lot of flux is it just the nature of trying to be the club that you are? How do you sort of perceive it? Yeah, I mean, I haven't done a deep analysis on this myself, but I don't think you'd see much more continuity from other teams. I do <laughs> think one specific factor to LAFC is when you're an expansion team, 
you are giving all of those players in 2018 a new contract. Okay. So typically they're four-year contracts. Right. So there is going to be a sort of a steeper cliff for us than other teams. Or now that we're in steady sw- state and we recruited in 2019 and 2020 and 20. So not all of our players are coming up to the end of their term at the same time. So that maybe played a factor in some of the, in terms of the amount of moves we had to make. But the other thing is what we talked about is we purposefully found identified players that we knew would not be here for 10 years. And I think now we have identified some players that really fit our model and how we want to play and finding that balance of MLS experience and veteran European experience and all of that. And uh, it's, it, that certainly wasn't by design. I think that was more the constraint of coming in in 18, having certain number of mm-hmm. players on terms and then moving the players on because they generated a good amount of interest. Let's talk about this off season first, and then we'll get into this season. Um, it, it feels from the outside, like one of the things you ID was MLS experience, Maxime Crepo, uh, mm-hmm. Ryan Hollingshead, sort of the list goes on and on in terms of the additions you made. Is that how it was seen internally? And mm-hmm. what was the process of looking around the league and, and figuring out where the pieces could come from? Yeah, so we certainly, I think, when I talk about the high risk, high reward, one of the things I learned, like COVID was sort of like the, you know, that quote from Buffett that it's a low tide, you see he's not wearing a bathing suit. Mm-hmm. I think COVID exposed some things and vulnerabilities that are inherent with a really young group. And so not just MLS experience, but just experience overall. And, I, and you know, if you just think about it logically for a person like me, COVID affected me less than it would have affected me if I was a 17-year-old that had just moved to Manchester, England without my family, right. and I can't socialize, and there are no fans, and all, you know, all the rest of it. And so I think that just exposed a little bit that maybe that balance was a little bit off. Um, certainly, I can't say it was way wrong because we were we had an amazing year in 2019. We were 20 minutes away from competing in a world club championship, all the rest of it. So I'm certainly not trying to frame this as a failure, but just again, as I say, those lessons that we apply along the way. And so at the end of last season, we knew there was a change in coach different from the first time we hired a coach. We knew the core to core group of players and we thought, okay, Steve, what do we think this team needs? The existing players. And we had Steve and we felt he really met sort of where they were and how we could take this team uh, forward. And then also, what do you think we need? And I think guys like Kellen, like Ryan, like Max, you know, I credit guys like John McCarthy, that is a, a goalkeeper who comes in every day. He fits our culture. He gets it. He's happy to be here. He's competitive. He pushes Max. And we have that around the field. We have that in Franco Escobar pushing Ryan Hollingshead and Elie coming in. And, you know, it just added a level of, NX, of MLS experience and know-how. And then you add to that Carlos' experience. You add to that Chiellini's experience, Bale's experience. And we just really feel like that helped cultivate a, a really strong culture of guys who knew, know, knew what it takes to win and train every day. And they are, I say I work for the players and the staff here. So I will say it that they are a pleasure to work for. Uh, let's talk about the coaching change. Steve Terundolo, obviously Bob Bradley and yourself, you guys were LAFC for a very long time working obviously hand in hand and, and Bob it, with you created, what is this club's identity? How do they play who you are? What was it like going from that the first time looking for the coach? And then when you look back now at Steve Terondolo, what has worked in, in sort of what was the process over this year? Yeah. Well, I think as you see with, teams around the world, coaching changes are hard and they're hard to manage through. And I think acknowledging that difficulty led us to a very thorough process as to what we felt the right fit was. And I think what has helped Steve hit the ground running is he was here for a year. And Mm -hmm. I think he showed great knowledge of our team, of what he felt changes could be made in order to help us improve. And I think what really became apparent, which not that I was looking for confirmation of my analysis, was this wasn't broken. Were we really pissed off that we didn't make the playoffs last year? Yes. Would data tell you that we should have and all the rest of it? Yes. Did that matter? No, we weren't in the playoffs. But does it matter in terms of your analysis? Yes. And I think what we said at the time, and I'll say now, 
uh, a revolution was not needed. And I think Steve and our scouts and our technical staff really identified things that we could tweak rather than transform. And we did that. And I think Steve's experience here in the building, he knew LAFC enabled him to hit the ground running in a way that I think is, was really beneficial because I do first time I've done it, but I've just observed and in speaking to colleagues, change is hard. I think going back a year, a little bit less than a year, uh, when we did make that change, I think it was surprising to some people, but what I want to emphasize is it's not surprising to anybody who actually knows Steve Trundle. Those are the people that were like, of course, I think people that don't know Steve maybe thought we were going to go in a different direction, but it was very clear in the process that what you're seeing from our opening day victory to now is exactly what Steve had analyzed and said in the process um, as we went through the various candidates. Uh, it was a bumpy road though for a team that won supporter shield. I think it's mm -hmm. very clear that it was unique in the amount of moves you made this summer for a team that was already leading uh, this what, year you're talking about this season. Yeah. Yep. And, and the moves you made and obviously moving on from DPs, bringing in new DPs, bringing in big names. There was that uh, a spell where you were the clear leaders and you're on a points record. And then all of a sudden the faces of the team are new faces and Gareth Bale and Chiellini yep. and, and other pieces like that. What was the summer like for you? And what was the conversation around the club of, was it needed? Do, do you look back now and say, well, it was right or it wasn't? How, how far out are you from that? I think it was, so internally, I think is a very different perspective than mm -hmm. externally. I do think if you analyze the moves we made, so I want to give utmost credit to Danny Masofsky. I want to give utmost credit to Ismail to Jury Shradi. I want to give utmost credit to Brian Rodriguez for everything they added to this group while they were here. We certainly had offers for more people that we mm -hmm. thought were absolutely fundamental to the success that we'd had to date. And if I could have kept all three of those guys, I'd have loved to, right? I care about them. It's really hard. That's the worst part of my job. But in order to add in our world, you need to make some decisions. Now, how significant it is, the departure is typically tied to who is coming in. Now we had to sell Brian Rodriguez to bring in Dennis, as an example, we um, needed to create roster space uh, on a number of those things. Did I think it was needed? Yes. Which is why I did it at the time. And again, you, you go off the information you have to hand. I think the position we are in now and our Last two games, I think you're starting to see more as to why we did it. Um, I don't think it necessarily made sense. And not, I don't want to say it didn't make sense. I understand the question. Mm -hmm. And what I always say is that we're not naive to the impact you have when you change things. Steve yeah. is a very recent player, as was I. But we did feel that to take this group to the next level, even with the success we'd had as we came into the summer, we felt like, for this team to not only win Supporter Shield, but win MLS Cup, we thought that these changes were put us in a better position to do so. And as I say, you go off the information you have to hand. And I certainly am grateful for the efforts and the contribution of the players we had to move. But I also am really excited about what Giorgio brings, what Gareth brings, what Dennis brings, what Sebastian brings, what Christian brings. And I also unfortunately have to acknowledge that the timing of our calendar does mm -hmm. not give a guy like Christian Teo and these guys time to get up to speed when we're in a playoff run and chasing a supporter shield and, and what have you. If you in the future, it comes up, obviously you mentioned the calendar. It's always going to be a summer transfer window is always going to be awkward for an MLS team. Do you think you would make moves like big names like Bale and Teo and Chiellini again? Yeah, and frankly, I don't think there is a GM in the league that would have said no to the deals mm -hmm. that we got with these guys. When you have an opportunity to sign these players, and I think obviously the majority of why we sign them is what they give us on a match day, but the, the intangibles these guys bring are priceless. And I think what we had to do to acquire them, we didn't uproot our team. Mm -hmm. The team that played is right. still here. The guys that were very, you know, I don't want to 
I don't want to uh, belittle their contributions. We're greatly appreciated. The guys that we did have to move, it was painful, but we did feel at the time like it was necessary. And I think the other thing is that our season is ending shorter. So there would have been more time in normal circumstances. The summer was unique in that regard. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think as one example, are we in a better place to win MLS Cup because Dennis Bowanga is here? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the other GMs, and one of the storylines this week, unavoidably, is going to be Ernst Tanner, obviously running Philadelphia Union. His comments in the summer about Gareth Bale and the surprise that he would be available to you on a mm-hmm. TAM contract. Um, you've been asked about it slightly, but now a little bit further out, what do you make of sort of the perception around the league about that move and and sort of what it what it shows to other teams or the way that they view it? Yeah, so I do want to say I'm not going to speak in depth. I talked to Ernst about it in a personal conversation between us. I, I, I heard his apology and how things got taken out of context, which I understand. Uh, the league then dealt with it and has nothing to do with me, how the league mm-hmm. sees it. What I will say is, is it surprising that we got Gareth Bale on a non-designated player contract and Giorgio Chiellini? Yeah, but we did. And right. so there is no, and I think the, any insinuation that it's anything other than that, I think is disrespectful and I take issue with, as do our owners. But look, I understand the question and the numbers for those who have access to them, they're all there. And I understand the question, but uh, certainly take issue with any insinuation that it is anything other than what is factually true. And uh, one of the tropes in sports is always, Whatever gets you to a trophy will work. If if this team does seal the deal, whether it's Giorgio Chiellini playing for 45 minutes or Gareth Bale playing for none, I think a lot of fans are going to look at it and say all of it worked, all of it uh, made sense. But you've brought up Dennis Buanga a couple of times. He's been the big difference maker. When you look at the team that was on the field against Austin, it really is a, a group of players that was there before the summer transfer window, except Chiellini. And Buanga. For Buanga, he's settling in. He's scoring these big goals. What is his ceiling in Major League Soccer? What will he be for LAFC going forward? Hard for me to put a ceiling on it. I think he has shown, he quickly got up to speed. I think our numbers show that exactly what we saw when we recruited him. And I, that was a very, la- like, up to the deadline, last minute signing for us, which was not necessarily fun, but it's all worth it in the end. <laughs> Um, No, look, Dennis, and this is when we looked at the planning for this season, we had this DP spot available in January. And when we had recruited and and got to our final list of players, we decided to wait. And I firmly believe that no decision is better than a bad decision. And so we waited with quite a bit of pressure to make that decision Mm -hmm. at that point. But what that afforded us is a few months to see this team gel like it did and then think, okay, what is the profile player that's going to take us to the next level and name blind, we gave the characteristics to our scouts, to our analysts and Dennis clearly came to the top Mm -hmm. of that list. And what he provides for us, which is different is what you see and the, how he complements what we already have um, in our team. We felt like he adds a dimension that we didn't necessarily have despite our success. Again, in the first half of the season, he added something different that we felt was an extra, uh, an extra level that we think is required to beat teams like the Galaxy and Austin and hopefully Philadelphia in do or die playoff moments to clinch supporter shields and all that. And Dennis is one, but I, I, I don't think it is just him. Mm-hmm. I give credit to everybody that was here that has come. Um, you know, Sebastian Mendez, I'll mention, comes in for the last few minutes to help us close a game. And he is, he is a starter in our league. Mm-hmm. who has accepted a role that it, when, if, he needs, if he's starting, he'll do, us, do a great job if he's coming off the bench. But these guys are here and they're committed. They're pulling in the same direction. And that's the direction of lifting a trophy Saturday. I may have buried the lead here in talking about all these moves, but the big question mark this year was Carlos Vela. And his contract was up in the summer, which uh, we're starting to see it a little more now, but it was fairly unprecedented uh, in MLS to have a player of that magnitude potentially just be out of contract in the middle of the season. Mm -hmm. Were there moments going through that where you were unsure that he'd be back? And what will it sort of feel like to you to see him lead the team out on Saturday for MLS Cup for the first time in LAFC history? It'll be what we signed him for. 
when first time I talked to Carlos, he's about winning. And that was consistent in the negotiations that we just went through. It was about winning. And I think Carlos sees that the pieces we've put around him have put him in a great position to lift a trophy, another trophy Saturday. And negotiations are never linear, or sorry, they are rarely linear. <laughs> was I worried he would leave? I wouldn't put it in that regard. I think Carlos yeah. and I have always level set on what's right for the club and what's right for him. And we have very open conversations to that end. And I never felt there was a disconnect. And obviously negotiations can be high and low, but in general, we were always tracking towards an agreement. Uh, you said it, you're an LA native. You've obviously been, uh, as I've said a couple times, part of this project since day one. What would an MLS Cup victory mean for the sport in LA, for this club, for this fan base, for yourself and, and your staff? Man, it's, uh, it'd be everything. You know, I think we, we've been an ambitious club from the get-go. We did not hide any excuses behind being an expansion club, a young club. We have gone after it from day zero. And this is the prize in our league. I definitely, by the sound of things, I value the Supporters Shield more than maybe some others. But <laughs> I think in this building, Supporters Shield was objective one, chronologically. And it puts us in a great position. Home field advantage throughout. Got pushed by Austin at certain points. Got pushed by Philly at certain points. Uh, but we are really proud of that first trophy. We're certainly now proud to be on top of the, the Western Conference, not just in the table, but having come through two difficult playoff matches. And man, this would just be uh, incredible for the club. I, as you say, I've seen the blood, the sweat, the tears that have gone into actually building a stadium, building a team. And yeah, I would just be, it's almost paternal at this point. Uh, just would be so happy for this club, for its supporters, having seen what we've all poured into this and showed all the way up from day one, it would be uh, an incredible achievement. We know a new club will win MLS Cup for the first time on Saturday. For John Thornton and his staff, they hope it'll be for LAFC. Either way, it's going to be a treat for all of us. The 3252 Bank of California, this squad against Philadelphia, this is what we've all been waiting for, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Good luck to you, John. Thank you for taking the time to talk with us. We really appreciate it, and uh, we'll see you on Saturday. Thanks, David.